big balls of it. Good afternoon, everyone. If you could please have your seat. We're going to uh, begin this fantastic panel in a couple of minutes now. It's coming. For information, I will proceed in French, so you can... Bonjour à toutes et à tous.
Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Merci infiniment euh, d'être venus aussi nombreux à cette séance plénière. Je vais parler en français, car nous sommes unis dans la diversité au sein de ce Parlement. Et je tiens bien à le, à le rappeler. Pour les personnes souhaitant une traduction, nous avons des interprètes en anglais, en français et en allemand, et je les remercie infiniment. Et pour celles qui ont, et ceux qui ont besoin d'une transcription textuelle, vous pouvez utiliser l'outil de synthèse vocale qui est disponible en 23 langues sur les sites de la conférence. Euh, enfin, on vous rappelle que vous pouvez poser des questions en ligne via l'application, que vous soyez présent dans cette salle ou que vous soyez euh, en ligne. Il y a à peu près dix ans, on était une vingtaine de personnes dans une salle. Je n'étais pas députée européenne. J'avais cofondé un institut qui s'appelait l'Institut Veblen et qui réfléchissait aux questions de transition écologique. On avait eu la fierté de traduire et de publier un livre avec des gens qui se trouvent dans cette salle. Bob Constanza, Ida Kubischowski, Tim Jackson, pour ne pas les nommer, Dominique Meda. Et puis, à l'intérieur, il y avait quelque chose qui s'appelait le Donut de Kate Worth, dont je suis tombée instantanément amoureuse. On était 20 dans une salle à débattre des questions de croissance verte contre décroissance. On était extrêmement fiers parce qu'on avait réussi à faire venir du genre du ministère de l'économie. Et donc, on a compté les uns et les autres débattre. Et d'un côté, il y avait ceux qui nous expliquaient que tous les avantages de la croissance verte et de l'autre, ceux qui nous expliquaient tous les avantages de la décroissance. Et vous savez, c'était comme un match de tennis. Quand on écoutait les uns, on disait « Ah, c'est... » C'est la raison, a évidemment raison. Quand on écoutait l'autre, on disait ah « ben non, elle a raison ». Et en fait, on n'arrivait pas à se mettre d'accord. Et pourquoi on n'arrivait pas à se mettre d'accord Parce que le PIB et la croissance du PIB n'étaient juste pas faits pour nous dire quoi que ce soit sur les questions sociales et sur les questions environnementales, parce qu'il n'a juste pas été créé pour ça. Ce n'est pas son job. Et donc, on s'est dit qu'on allait travailler sur les questions de post-croissance que pour savoir ce qui se passait dans le domaine environnemental, il nous fallait des indicateurs physiques. Et pour savoir ce qui, nous, ce qui se passait dans le domaine social, il fallait des indicateurs sociaux. Ça paraît une évidence. Je vous assure qu'il y a dix ans, ça n'était pas une évidence. Et qu'il a fallu la pugnacité, le courage, la volonté, je serais tentée de dire notamment de femmes, et je pense à Dominique Méda, je pense à Florence Janicatrice, je pense à Kate Rewars, mais je penserai aussi à Éloi Laurent, à Jean Gadret. Bref, il a fallu que des pionniers qui se fassent par ailleurs un petit peu insultés par tout le monde, sur leur droite comme sur leur gauche, car le modèle productiviste était à l'époque très très bien ancré. Donc, c'est pour vous dire mon émotion aujourd'hui, grâce à Philippe Lambert, qui a été infatigable sur cette question depuis des années, et évidemment ses équipes, mais déjà au précédent mandat, tu avais organisé des conférences sur le sujet, mais c'est vous dire mon émotion de, vous, de voir autant de monde réunis pour parler dans le détail des questions de post-croissance. On n'est pas 20 dans cette salle. Donc bravo, merci infiniment et je suis contente de voir que le Parlement européen peut se prendre une pause de réflexion. On est un Parlement qui travaille, qui travaille beaucoup sur les questions techniques et avoir des moments de réflexion, on sait exactement où on veut aller, je trouve que c'est essentiel. Vous avez entendu ce matin, j'imagine, un très grand nombre de discours, mais moi je n'étais pas encore au Parlement parce que j'étais dans des réunions de négociation et j'ai vu passer, euh, je crois qu'Ursula von der Leyen a mentionné le rapport du Club de Rome. C'est ça. Hein je crois qu'elle a même dit qu'elle était d'accord avec les conclusions. Très bien. J'en suis parfaitement heureuse. Moi, j'aime beaucoup l'amour. Mais à l'amour, je préfère toujours les preuves d'amour. Et je crois que dans le domaine de la post-croissance, on a besoin de preuves d'amour. Et maintenant que le constat est là, eh bien, très bien, réformons les règles budgétaires et réformons le semestre européen, réformons notre plan de relance, non pas pour reproduire ce que nous avons fait jusqu'à présent, mais justement pour nous donner la possibilité d'aller vers un monde de prospérité sans croissance, comme disait l'excellent Tim Jackson. C'est donc mon plaisir aujourd'hui et mon honneur d'avoir 
parmi d'être entouré de gens absolument exceptionnels pour discuter de cette, de cette question. J'ai l'honneur d'avoir Maros Sefcovic, vice-président de la Commission européenne chargée des relations institutionnelles. Et je tiens à saluer son travail et son ouverture et le dialogue qu'il peut avoir sur ce genre de questions. Katri Worth, enseignante à l'Environmental Change Institute de l'Université d'Oxford. Romina Boarini, directrice du centre WISE de l'OCDE. L'OCDE travaille aussi depuis longtemps sur ces questions. Et c'est toujours aussi sous la direction de femmes, si je peux me permettre. Euh, Florent Janicatris, professeur à l'Université de Lille, qui a travaillé incroyablement aussi sur les questions d'indicateurs. Et Giorgios Calis, dont j'ai mal prononcé le nom, professeur à l'Université autonome de Barcelone, qui lui aussi réfléchit depuis très longtemps à cette question. Je vais me taire pour pouvoir avoir le plaisir de vous écouter les uns et les autres. Et je laisse maintenant la parole à Maros Sefcovic. Merci infiniment d'être ici. Merci, cher Aurore. Bon, bon jour et bon après-midi à tous et à toutes. And I really would like to thank you for your kind introduction. And first and foremost, I really would like to thank all of you for coming to Brussels and for making this huge hemicycle as full as I rarely have opportunity to see. And I am so happy to see that there are so many young people who are interested in this very important topic because it's about you. It's about the future, and it's about uh, the, the future of Europe and the future of our planet. And, and very rarely uh, uh, I see so many people in such a positive spirit, but I think that today the prize for, uh, for beaming positive energy across the hall is indeed Philip Lambert, because <laughs> with him we've been uh, discussing the possibility to have uh, this Europe-wide conference and discussion quite some time ago, and I'm, I'm so happy that we collaborated so well as a institutions, as a, as a member states uh, and uh, academia to make sure that uh, you can listen to different aspects uh, of this very important issue, uh, make your own judgment, and I think in a positive sense to push us uh, to go really beyond the GDP. And, and therefore, I don't have to hide that it's indeed my pleasure to be here with you uh, at, uh, at this uh, conference, uh, because uh, uh, this is not the first one. And if you want to be honest, uh, we have to say that uh, we've been discussing this type of uh, uh, issues and challenges already quite some time ago. If you look at our archives, I can tell you that the European Union held its first high-level conference on this topic already back in 2007. And uh, today, various initiatives such as United Nations Sustainable Development Goals aim to revitalize a, a global partnership for the sustainable uh, development. But despite the general agreement that using gross domestic products by itself to measure the growth and progress of our society is indeed a limited approach, progress in integrating this idea into policymaking has been slow. So growth, GDP growth, uh, remains still, because of all this, uh, our main point of reference. But what would happen if uh, we took into account other factors, like, for example, environmental sustainability? Would the world ranking change for, say, Saudi Arabia, whose GDP was the 18th highest in the world in 2022, but almost half of which was due to the oil extraction? And this is the question we started asking ourselves also in our community of uh, strategic uh, foresight, foresight experts who've been helping me to draft uh, the strategic foresight reports, which was a novelty since the arrival of uh, our new uh, president at that time, Ursula von der Leyen, to whom you had, uh, I'm sure, the, the, the pleasure to listen this morning. And, uh, when we've been looking uh, at the future, is it it's really inevitable that uh, India uh, will surpass Europe in terms of uh, nominal GDP by 2050? Shouldn't we have a more comprehensive look at how to measure the economic growth? And therefore, our first strategic uh, uh, foresight report called for the shift to the new economic model. 
which should be supported by an integrated approach to measuring also well-being beyond GDP. In other words, uh, the question was, how can we turn sustainability and well-being into the recipe for Europe's open strategic autonomy underpinned by our economic security and trade power? And I can also tell you that we are currently working to provide some answers to these very complex uh, uh, questions and the answers will be presented uh, in our strategic foresight report which we are presenting for this year and uh, which we plan uh, to publish uh, before the summer break. As we look to steer Europe through the twin green and digital transition in uncertain times, the subject is uh, more important than ever. And our areas for action on this topic will help shape our policies today, but also very clearly in the coming years and coming decades. And therefore, I think we have to use uh, our abilities, our new uh, techniques of anticipatory um, a governance like strategic foresight to make sure that we would present the shared and operational vision of how we can determine our progress as we look to build a socially and economically sustainable, competitive, but also resilient future for Europe. And uh, what is very important to, to say is that we are not starting from the scratch. Already back in 2020, when we started with our strategic foresight uh, uh, analysis, we put forward and proposed uh, to our policymakers and decision takers that the resilience should become a new strategic pillar for all EU policies on par with the twin and, grid, uh, and digital transition. And I believe that you would agree with me that especially lessons learned from COVID crisis have proven us correct in that regard. We also proposed in that report uh, a new tool, which I'm sure we'll be also discussing with the prominent uh, panelists uh, who kindly join me in uh, the debate uh, uh, with you, and these are resilient uh, dashboards. And I'm very glad uh, that the professors who are behind me help us with their contributions to make sure that these resilient dashboards would not uh, remain just uh, subject of uh, academic uh, discussions, but that uh, they will gradually become uh, from the concept stage uh, into the part uh, of our ongoing reflection how to go beyond GDP and how to do it in a holistic manner across the green, digital, socioeconomic and geopolitical dimensions. And I think what is very important for you to know that the resilient dashboards have become now an integral part of the country reports that form part of the European semester cycle of economic policy coordination, which is one of our main instruments in the EU, how to look uh, into the cooperation, collaboration and steering of uh, our economies across the member states. And then I'm sure that uh, our president Ursula von der Leyen touched upon the importance of uh, recovery and resilience uh, facility which brought uh, necessary financial uh, support and is clearly designed not only to mitigate the economic impact of the pandemic on GDP but also to boost Europe's resilience through reforms and investment. So we have made some progress but it's now time as I said a few minutes earlier to take another step forward. GDP remains a useful indicator for economic output uh, being closely linked to tax revenues and gross national income. But it tells us nothing about, for example, income distributions, quality of life, quality of health care, quality of education, environmental protection, or the social costs of achieving that economic output. So we have to, and we are, developing a new monitoring framework to guide our efforts towards going beyond GDP, following up on uh, uh, an area for action that we have identified previously. For the first time, the European Commission is bringing together all the different strands of work uh, on this complex topic into the single framework. This approach is aimed at progressively complementing uh, GDP with, indica with indicators uh, for other elements that are important for the sustainable future we are seeking to build. We can consider this a new metric of well-being, which will feed into EU policymaking in the coming years and decades.
That means the well-being of people today, including different aspects of uh, quality of life. But it also means the well-being of people tomorrow, which will require intergenerational fairness, solidarity and inclusiveness as sustainable progress uh, should leave no one and no place behind. Additionally, we must also look beyond our borders and measure sustainable and inclusive well-being not only in the EU but also in third countries. And we need to continue contributing to the wider discussion with the international community, especially with regards to the work being done on this subject by the OECD and the United Nations. Our 2023 Strategic Foresight Report will provide the first results from our internal foresight work on this very important reflection. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, uh, the debate around going beyond GDP must be an open one. So, if you want to make a progress and we want it to bear fruit and have an impact on our policy making, there is a need for continued dialogue between all those involved, as it was when we've been preparing this conference. EU institutions, member states, civil society, NGOs, academias and business. And we need the best brains. Uh, to contribute, so I'm happy so many of you are here, because we definitely uh, can benefit from that. And uh, therefore, the occasions and the debates like we have today are so important and are so relevant. This joint effort must continue as it can help us steer a path to the sustainable, resilient and fair future that we are trying to build for future generations of Europeans. And I will stop here because, as you are, I'm also very much uh, interested to the other interventions, to your questions, to your comments, to your statements, and to the debate we will all have. So once again, thank you very much for the interest into the topic. Thank you very much for making uh, this hemicycle so full. And thank you very much for being so supportive and so active on this matter. Thank you. Merci, cher. Vice-président, je vais maintenant donner la parole à Madame Catherine Worth, qui est venue avec des choses. Vous allez voir ça. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. What is the shape of progress? What image do we have in our mind of progress? The 20th century apparently gave us a very dominant shape of progress, like this. Ah, yeah. <laughs> growth, endlessly. And as everybody knows, exponential growth, it doesn't just stop where this hose pipe stops, it goes through the ceiling. It was measured with one number, we called it GDP. The challenge, of course, is that we know that economic activity is resource intensive. It uses energy. It uses materials. And the direction that needs to travel is the other way, because of the massive overshoot we face. So goodbye to the one piece of pipe. We need to start again. We need a new compass for where we actually want to go, a new shape of progress that serves these times, that serves what we already know. So I offer you one. The only donut that actually turns out to be good for us, because you don't need to eat this one. We just need to put it into practice. The goal? Leave no one in the hole in the middle of the donut, falling short on the essentials of life. And leave no one without life's essential resources. But at the same time, do not overshoot that outer limit. That is where we destroy the life-supporting systems of the only known living planet in the universe. Meet the needs of all people within the means of this living planet. Surely this is our existential shared goal. This is a new shape of progress because it's not endless growth. It's thriving in balance between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling. In fact, I'm going to invite you to do this right now with your hands. Just do this shape. Thri yeah, here we are. Right? Thriving in balance. And if you do it just close here, it's just like a heartbeat. 
We already know in our own bodies that our bodies thrive when they are healthy in balance. Enough food, water, oxygen, heat, but not too much. Human health lies in balance. Can we take what we deeply know in our bodies and take from human health to planetary health and create a living world of which we are a part that thrives in balance? If balance is the shape of future progress, we are so far from that right now. As all the red here shows, billions of people in the world fall short on the essentials of life. And we are overshooting six, at least six, of the nine planetary boundaries. I've no doubt that all of our children's children will tug every one of us on the sleeve one day and say, did you know about this? And what did you do once that you knew? How did you transform your work in business, in government, in education? In community activism, how did you transform your lifestyle, your country, your company? Surely this is the story to turn around. And we need metrics that tell us where to go and then policies that actually take us there. From the global donut, we can go to national donuts. Four very different countries, Malawi, human shortfall without overshooting their share of the planet. China. Double whammy, human shortfall and ecological overshoot. Let's go to the US at the end. Massive ecological overshoot, drawing so much of Earth's resources into the United States. And Europe there, the European nations. Certainly human shortfall and ecological overshoot together. This is the story to turn around. How can this start to happen? What if every nation in Europe, indeed in the world, started to say this is our goal now? How do we unroll this donut? Let's open it up and go inside between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling. I invite everyone, imagine a place you live and love and ask of it this question. How can our nation become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? This is what the shape of progress becomes. In fact, we have four questions to ask here. There's local aspirations. How can everybody here thrive with food, health, education, housing, transport, respect, income, a life of dignity for all here? And how can local nature here thrive? How can our cities repair and restore and regenerate the ecosystems of which we're a part? Beautiful local aspirations. But every city, every nation is part of the world, embedded through global supply chains, through global policies, through histories of colonialism, through futures of climate and ecological impacts. We are connected to the world and must take our responsibilities for the whole. So how can we respect the health of the whole planet, come back within that ecological overshoot of energy use and material use, reduce our impact, come back within this single living planet? And how do we respect the rights of people worldwide, the people who stitched the clothes we're wearing, who picked and packed the food we've eaten, who assembled the lights and phones and cameras and screens and made the carpets and all the materials? They are worldwide. We have a right, a responsibility to respect their lives too. So fine ideas. Local aspirations and global responsibilities. What if we actually put this into practice? This is where we must now go. We have the vision, now we need the action. There are over 70 cities and regions, and it's begun with cities and regions, not with nations, but cities, districts, towns and regions, who've taken this very concept and are putting it into practice in local government around the world. Let me show you just two. Barcelona has unrolling the donut, gathering the metrics, holding itself to account. This will be the beginnings of the future tool for monitoring whether or not this city is living within the donut. What will be the policies that will actually take them there? How will they reduce their carbon and material footprint while providing housing and education and health for all? This is the 21st century challenge every city and nation must take on. Brussels, right here, a 10-minute ride away. I was this morning in a fantastic meeting, the Brussels capital region, led by Barbara Tracht, Secretary of State for Economic Transition. 
are looking at Brussels through this lens with all the monitoring indicators, but then following up with policies. She was telling us we are changing the rules, the regulations, so that only businesses that are beginning to respect these planetary boundaries can do business here. Public finance from 2030 will only flow to companies that actually are coming into this space. Public money will only fund research and innovation that takes us into this space. Let's put on service public services that ensure the, the resources we have provide first for the rights of all people, the universal basic services we need in place. The Zoe Institute have created such a compass for the whole European Union, using its own dashboards of resilience, its own metrics. It's time to follow through with these metrics, with policies that turn them into practice. Not a stability and growth pact, but accompanying that with a well-being and, uh, well and sustainability pact, guided by these metrics, because these are the metrics that will take us safely with security, with resilience, with human rights and ecological integrity through the 21st, to the 21st century. What thrills me is to work with policymakers who are already doing this, who get in touch and say we're, we're, we're in action. This is where leadership is, along with the youth, the policymakers who say we're on it, we're doing it in these cities. And we've just published a report which is showing how these 70 places are starting to put this into practice. Let's make this practice everywhere. Let's build on the peer leadership of those who are already in action, showing that what some think is impossible is already beginning to happen. Are they as far as they need to be? No way. No way. This is a challenge to begin in a city that's embedded in a nation, embedded in a region, embedded in a global system that is pushing back with power against these changes. And yet we start, and yet we rise. So it is time to put these ideas into practice, to take all the indicators we have and follow through with policies that actually begin to deliver this new shape of progress that is thriving. Thank you very much. Merci infiniment, Kate. Je vois que le donut a bien évolué en en dix ans et qu'il est en plus adopté maintenant dans, dans, dans beaucoup de, de villes. J'ai le plaisir maintenant de donner la parole à Romina Boirini, directrice du centre Wise de l'OCDE, une institution qui nous a permis de travailler excessivement bien ces dernières années pour mettre plus de justice fiscale dans ce monde, qui sera bien utile d'ailleurs pour la transition écologique. La parole est à vous. Merci beaucoup. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for inviting the OECD to be part of this very, very important conversation. I think we were all very encouraged throughout the day to see how high is the momentum at the very high level of the EU uh, policy making. Uh, of course, we've been partnering with many of you in the room with Europe, uh, but also you know, with the academia. Uh, and I see a lot of friends uh, that obviously have been instrumental uh, to set this in motion. Uh, today, I just wanted to focus on three quick points because I was here during the day and I saw that the room has a lot of questions, so I really want to move to the most interactive part of the debate. But I want to focus uh, quickly on the why, the how, and the what of the well being. And so, when it comes to the why, uh, again, we heard many today talking about the many. Uh, interconnected challenges that all societies, all countries of this world are facing today. And those, cha those challenges come from this very imbalanced economic model. And we have a problem, of course, it's not just the economy of society, but this is actually endangering uh, the democracy. And so if we can't show the value that our shared uh, democratic societies are in fact bringing to us, then we're going to obviously create a real, real real breakdown of the social contract. So all the recent crises have shown this, that in absence of very, very immediate systemic changes, uh, we are going to have uh, a further increase of inequalities. I think it's very clear in these charts. Uh, so let me start by telling you about the uh, mental health conditions, and this is something actually that goes well beyond the most vulnerable. Uh, in the OECD countries, uh, 
one, uh, in fact, about one quarter of the OECD populations are facing today a mental health issue. In other words, these people actually are reporting a lot of symptoms of anxiety and depression. So this is really a sign that the society is not thriving. And there are groups that are more uh, concerned in the sense that they are more hit by these issues, and this is the young. 40% of the young people in uh, this OECD countries for which we have done the study actually are coming up with this high level of mental distress. Cost of the living crisis. Uh, if I tell you uh, about the inflation rate in Europe uh, in February was 13%, and that was ranging from 5% in Luxembourg to 28% uh, in Hungary. But actually, this is just the average inflation rate. When you're looking at the cost of living crisis and who is paying the price for that, it's once again the most vulnerable. The low-income people, the ones that live in the rural areas, uh, but also the young and the elderly. And last but not least, and again, that was said uh, really many times during the day, so I will be very short on this one, uh, six of the planetary boundaries have already been overcome, and the ecological footprints uh, are, continue to grow uh, in many, many regions of the world. So how do we address that? It all starts with measurement. I think in the OECD, this is what we've been doing for the last 15 years, really sort of come up with metrics and a very, very strong uh, measurement framework that could be used by many countries, by many communities. And this is the well-being framework that we introduced back in 2011. This is a framework that really focuses on what matters to people, but in terms of their economic well-being and non-economic well-being, so relational, personal, social well-being, all those aspects are actually included in the well-being framework. So it's really, really important. I think over the day I heard a lot of people talking about the quality of social bonds of communities, the strengths of communities, the strengths of social relationships, the social capital. So this is included here. And of course, it's not just about the average outcomes, but also how those outcomes vary across the population. So again, it is important to put a strong focus on uh, the ones that are indeed left behind by the system. And also, somebody this morning talked about the interactions and uh, you know, the intersectionalities here, because a lot of these advantages unfortunately accumulate. So we can't just look at you know, uh, the, sort of the, the big differences in the system. We really need to understand again how uh, the disadvantages compound across the many uh, life domains. Finally, it's not obviously about uh, the well-being uh, as we know it today. This is about building up for the future, building up resources for the future. So we need to understand what are the key capitals. And this is what we're trying to do in this framework. So we're looking at four uh, key uh, types of capital, natural capital, social capital, human capital, and economic capital, and again, how they are distributed in the populations. This is something that uh, very often is actually overlooked, even by the most uh, sophisticated statistical systems of this world. So this gives you a very, very powerful tool to monitor progress. And this is something we've been applying in the OECD for many, many years. But the most interesting piece of information I may share with you today is the fact that today 70% of o the OECD countries, meaning 30 countries, the most rich countries of this world, in fact, have introduced their own well-being frameworks, which is really, really important because obviously we need to have strong buy-in and ownership by each jurisdiction. But those uh, frameworks are modelled uh, around, I would say, the broad lines of the OECD framework. And that is important as well, because we also need to have some na national consistencies. So now I want to go to the perhaps most challenging part of this discussion, uh, which is the issues of what we do, what type of policies. As we start this discussion, and many of you are very, I would say, old on this, but many are very new. And a lot of questions come to the table. How do we actually do that? So what are the concrete solutions we need here? So we've been kind of trying to sort of articulate this in the OECD for a while. And what we're trying to offer today is the idea that we need to come with solutions that are triple wins, meaning that solutions that are good for the uh, thriving, so for making societies and economies thriving today, it's good from the perspective of reducing inequalities and it's also good from a sustainability perspective. So we're trying to say, let's think of the challenges. So every policy makers think about the challenges you're facing and try to devise solutions that answer to all these questions at the same time. Now, of course, sometimes it doesn't work, but actually, some, in other cases, it does work. So I want to give you some illustrations of the, the policies that we consider triple wins. First of all, 
let me start by uh, jobs creation. We need, of course, jobs. It means we want, obviously, in this very, very particular context today, the post-pandemic uh, recovery, we want to make sure this recovery is job rich, but it's you know, not every type of jobs. We need to have high quality jobs. That means jobs with high security, high stability, equitable earnings, and uh, I think uh, today there were people talking about living wages, minimum wages. Europe have done a lot in this respect, but more needs to happen. But also jobs uh, that actually come with a lot of resources for the well-being of workers in the workplace. Uh, another example, another illustration, okay, in the wake up of the mental health crisis that we have observed during the pandemic, is everything that governments can, to do, can do to promote and prevent ment mental health illnesses. And I think one of the problems with policy making in general is that you know, we want to go with quick fix. So if there is a problem, we just want to act. And that is good, I think, on the one hand. But on the other hand, the problem is we take solutions that sometimes are very narrow, very short-sighted. The problem with mental health is that there are so many factors, actually, that are driving uh, the mental distress that we're seeing today in OECD societies. And before it takes a whole of the government, a whole of society approach, we need programs really that uh, comes in many different uh, policy areas. It's not just what the healthcare sector can do. For instance, we need to have strong mental health interventions in schools, but we also have to uh, put together some programs that uh, let's say, leverage interlinkages with the mental and financial health. So, for instance, very speci specific type of debt relief uh, programs for people, actually, that are in a very, very uh, sort of um, in, in, in material hardship and uh, material depression conditions and, at the same time, mentally health. So, there are many other imp important examples of this. And, again, so the, the basic message there that it needs to happen across the board. I have other examples. Uh, let me say... Uh, very quickly about focusing on the disadvantaged children, youth and their families. And I think this is obviously about investing in their human capital. Europe introduced something that is very, very important. It's called the child guarantee. This is about providing uh, the adequate uh, level of services when it comes to health, to social services, uh, to education and housing. This is so important. And obviously that comes with a lot of returns in the previous discussion. Uh, you know, we, we talk about how we finance actually welfare actually the best way to finance uh, the welfare state is invest in human capital. That actually is bringing a lot of positive returns. Finally, how do we green the economy? Of course, it's a massive, huge transformation. We have to do a lot of things. And again, today we heard about sort of rethinking industrial policy from that perspective. But this is also about how we support the vulnerable households uh, who are, uh, in fact, in a situation to, of energy poverty. So how do we make sure that uh, on, the, on the one hand we can help them obviously, uh, facing that big transition. But at the same time, we're doing it with price-based mechanisms because we also have to disintensivize the use of fossil fuels. And this is also about supporting the workers, uh, the communities and the businesses that uh, are impacted uh, by the shift of economic opportunities that come along with the decarbonisation. And finally, this is about working with the private sector and making sure that, again, the businesses are given a lot of responsibility and are made accountable uh, about those shifts. The, the final word I want to say is about, you know, these are example of policies, but actually here we're talking, as I said, the big system change, and that only comes through a big interventions in terms of governance. And I think this is really what we would like to see from Europe going forward, having that leadership in, term, in terms of you know, redesigning uh, uh, the whole governance systems. I think Aurora was sharing some of the obviously places, probably the key levers, uh, you know, the key governance programs in Europe, but there are many more. And this is about really engineering the system, having a broad uh, overview of how the different policy interventions that Europe is introducing, but also Europe is coordinating with the rest of the world, how those impact uh, the well-being of people. Thank you so much. Uh, Je ne sais pas si vous, vous voyez un peu les, 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 certains joailliers ont une capacité de voir à l'œil nu la pureté de certaines pierres. Et je serais tentée de dire que Florence Janicatrice, c'est exactement la même chose. Elle a un œil parfaitement affûté 
pour voir immédiatement quels sont les indicateurs qui peuvent être problématiques, pas problématiques. C'est l'une des personnes euh, la plus constante que j'ai eu la chance de rencontrer dans ma vie et qui a le plus aussi travaillé avec le groupe que j'ai cité tout à l'heure euh, sur les indicateurs. C'est mon grand plaisir d'accueillir Florence Janicatrice au micro. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm really, really honored to be here, and I thank you, Philippe, and all for this invitation. Um, if we really want to change our goals and shift from GDP growth to social and ecological prosperity and sustainability, we should probably first get involved in a collective introspection on the symbolic and social power that numbers have in our collective life and in our ways to conduct public policies. The socio-historian Alain Desrosiers recalled us that the process of um, quantification or production of indicators needs two steps. The first one is to convene upon and then to measure. And indeed, indicators are really frameworks of representation and of interpretation of realities. They reflect as much as they institute the reality. They make it in a way. They embody the way by which public problems are conceptualized and solutions imagined. Getting new indicators to go beyond growth, which is definitely not sufficient but necessary, requires upstream to agree on what ought to be measured downstream. Now, why is this question being asked today? We were very few, as Aura mentioned earlier, at the end of the 90s to insist on the fact that the major macroeconomic indicators were really misleading GDP and growth, inflation and employment, even major elements of the magical square. Misleading because growth has been imagined after World War II to follow a specific political project to track the expansion of material activity and, of, and the expansion of the market. This had been discussed by pioneers in France, in particular around the work of Dominique Meda, What is Health, Wealth, in 1999, on the one hand, and Jean Gadret on the other, and also by pioneers in Belgium with Isabelle Cassiers, just to name a few. They and I gathered with members of the civil society in the Forum for Other Indicators of Wealth with the idea of stimulating reflection in France and then later to influence the work of the Stiglitz Commission. We advocated that the Commission should be open to debate with civil society. But on this specific point, we failed. It is true, though, that since the, the Stiglitz and C Commission in 2009 and their report on the measurement of economic performance and social progress, things have drastically uh, changed. We really have entered a new regime of knowledge where discussing these issues to go beyond growth is now regarded, as it's, we, we experience it today, as both academically and politically relevant. Whereas 20 years ago, we were regarded either as dangerous radicals or sweet dreamers. There is a strong legitimacy in renewing the questions of being GDP and growth, and I guess a true willingness to implement new tools for knowledge and for governmentality. Should we all agree on the fact that changing the goal is an emergency, we should shift from GDP growth to social and ecological prosperity. But the question is how to do it. For instance, Amasya Sen said to the media right after the Commission's work in 2009 that we should organize discussions about the future we want. Okay, but a discussion with whom and by who? There is concretely a wide range of legitimation processes to decide what counts and who counts what counts. On the one hand, here on your left, One of the legitimation process comes from the world of expertise, and the experts are to a certain respect useful, obviously, but they are equipped with their semantic fields, their own tools and representations, their values regarding to what is good and what is desirable, and their theoretical frameworks. But not only do these theoretical frameworks embark with them their values, but they also face difficulties to adopt new languages, 
and they take into account and to take into account the social and ecological challenges and this is especially true when using the monetary language which embark with it the implicit idea of weak sustainability and the mythic possibility of decoupling economic growth from our anthropogenic footprint <laughs> on the other hand uh, here on your right, another legitimation process comes from the world of the individual. This world is often called up on the fact that social prosperity, very often translated in this world into happiness, would be far too subjective to be embodied with objective indicators. But in this world, these subjectivities are grounded on the spontaneous revelation of individual preferences. And the idea behind is that the sum of these individual preferences would form the collective interest, as if the sum of, of our total spontaneous individual satisfactions could mechanically conduct us without institutions, without political choice, to a collective happiness. In between, in between, there is plenty of room for a third path, probably even more than a third, which I qualify as the world of citizens. Here, the aim is to develop temporary shared conventions about well-being for all and for social and ecological sustainability. All the experiments grounded on that world show that it is also a very important by-side way for fostering democracy. In this world, the idea is not to, tell, to talk to everyone, but before all, to listen to communities' voices. In this world, the idea is not only to measure the level of democracy, but to practice it. The third pass has been experienced in many territories all over the world. It requires, among other things, a strong communication ethic, a true willingness for the inclusion of the voice of all. I have myself conducted different experiments based on this world of citizens. It's very demanding, it's also time consuming to build an index of social health and an index of ecological health. The combination of both is one way, there are others, to track the possibility of territories, local places, to be or not virtuous on the path of their social health, on the path of their ecological health, and on the possibility of being on a virtuous path on these two intertwined sides of our common humanity. I thank you very much. Merci, chère Florence. Et maintenant, c'est un plaisir d'entendre Yorgos Kalis, qui, lui, a cette spécificité de... On on... Quand on lit ses papiers, il nous prend toujours quelque part à, à rebrousse-poil. Il y a toujours quelque chose de nouveau, toujours quelque chose d'intéressant, qu'on soit d'accord ou pas d'accord. C'est toujours quelqu'un qui donne à, à réfléchir. Et merci infiniment pour votre travail. Le floor is yours, comme on dit. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank uh, Philippe Lambert and the 20 MEPs who organized this amazing event. I can't imagine how much work it must have taken. And I also want to thank uh, the assistants to the MEPs, that they are the ones who are doing an amazing footwork. I know it because it was my first job, actually, when I was 23 years old. I was assistant in the research office of the parliament. The, this building was being built at the time, so it's quite a few years. But I know how much work it takes uh, just to do your normal job as an assistant, and I can't imagine how much on top of that to mount all this thing here. So thank you very much. So I want to change a little bit the page compared to the previous presentation and argue that redefining prosperity is not just about changing the indicators and the data we use to measure it, crucial as this is, and it's very crucial, I'm not denying that. But I want to argue that it is also a lot about listening to and valuing different existing models of prosperity that are under attack. Models other than those based on a one-way future consisting only of growth. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I want to talk about the Mediterranean approach to prosperity, but let's see what is this. 
So we in the West, uh, and I talk about West in a general sense here, tend to take the meaning of terms like progress, prosperity, or development for granted. But as the recent scientific research on the so-called pluriverse of post-development shows, there are many, many different ways civilization across the world have thought and practiced the good life and have come to conceive well-being. From when Vivir and Suma Kausa in Latin America to Ubuntu in Africa, Swaraj in India, Ibadism in the Arab world, or Hurai among the Chinese Tuva people, I didn't know all these different visions of well-being and I learned them by reading this book by my colleagues. As a Greek, I'm Greek, uh, you might have guessed from my name, I'm particularly keen on Mediterranean versions of prosperity, visions that chart uh, in the words of uh, the late Italian sociologist from Bari, Franco Cassano, a different path that by decommodifying at least in part the sun and the sea, makes them become again shared public properties and the center of southern identity. A path that removes the negative sign from all statistics of the south because it stops comparing with that which is other than itself. All this might sound a little bit poetic and rhetorical. Is there empirical evidence on the ground, however, of such an alternative Mediterranean or southern path and how it works? Studying Mediterranean models of prosperity brought me eight years ago now to the island of Icaria in Greece. This is the island apparently where people forget to die. According to the most downloaded and popular article in the New York Times magazine in 2012, the New York Times shared there the story of Stamatis Moraitis, uh, the guy in the picture, a Greek-American who diagnosed with terminal cancer in 1976, moved back to Icaria to die. 46 years later, 102 years old, Moraitis was still alive and cancer-free. <laughs> so don't rush to go to Icaria, eh? but it's, <laughs> it's true, it's a true story. The article, written by Dan Buetner, a National Geographic Fellow, shows how the mystery of exceptionally long lives in islands like Ikaria or Sardinia in Italy or Okinawa in Japan, what is called the Blue Zones, is not explained just by a single factor, but by a combination of several things. Healthy, lean, mostly vegetarian diets, homegrown food, not so rigid work schedules, important for all of us here to remember, lots of walking, lots of uh, talking and lots of socializing, as for example in Icaria's notorious summer festivals. Uh, they are the other picture, obviously, and they do indeed go like that round until you are dizzy. Uh, the article in, uh, uh, confirms, in line with the latest scientific research by psychologists, and this is a study that came out this year uh, by Harvard uh, University, psychologists at Harvard University, that published the study of adult development, which is an 85 years uh, long study of following people and looking at what determines their well-being over time. That what makes people happy is not money, is not class, but it's social relations, it's social bonds, it's family, community and friends. In academic uh, jargon, uh, we use the not so perfect term degrowth to signify this model of prosperity, which is based on simplicity, relating and sharing, instead of having, accumulating and consuming. When I was presenting degrowth in a public event in Icaria, when I was doing my research there, a local interrupted me protesting. But this is how we have been living for ages. What are you presenting to us here, you know? <laughs> and she was right. As we documented with our subsequent research with my co-authors in this uh, paper, the island indeed sustains a low pace and low impact mode of living based on diverse economies and persevering communal institutions. I'm often told by critics of the growth that people want more, you know, more money, more stuff, more everything. How are we going to convince the people it's the standard argument, no? But that's not what I observed in Korea. And that's not what I see even in the New Yorkers who burn a fortune to fly all the way to Icaria to get just a few ta days taste of the good life. People will never buy into the growth I hear. Uh, well, they are already doing it and they are paying a lot actually. <laughs> I don't mean to idealize life in Icaria. And that has always to be uh, the caution reminder here when we look for models that can inspire us. The locals I interviewed there talk not only of the good life, but also of the hard life. How austerity cuts at the time and continued since then were leaving them without hospital and schools. How cheap imports were killing local farms and orchards, leaving few economic alternatives other than the vulgar type of 
tourism and real estate development that one starts finding in islands nearby, next to Icaria, like Mykonos. And in Greece, that's like a very important part of the public debate right now. The destruction of the islands and of a way of life, of summer life, that has been important for all of us Greeks in the name of tourist development, money from tourism, paying the debt in the name of uh, GDP growth. My point here, of course, is not that all of Europe should become like Icaria or Icarias. But that as a minimum, Icarias, places like Icarias, should be allowed to stay the way they are. The thesis I support here is not moral, but is based on evidence. There are and there have always been other models of being and relate, relating, well-functioning models of prospering with little. We don't need to reinvent anything. We don't need to reinvent models of prosperity. We just have to look around at what already exists and which is being demolished as we speak. These models are not in the, in the south in a sense of a geographical south. Uh, these models of prosperity, I imagine, and I'm sure that they are, in the French or German countryside, the Alps, Scandinavia, the Balkan mountains, or the Hungarian plains that I haven't visited, but I'm sure they exist there too. The problem is that unless we talk about them and we learn to see them, these different ways of prospering, uh, we will never study them, we will never understand them, we will never value them, and our statistics will keep missing them. So some questions to finish. What would the new model of EU convergence look like, one in which not only the South has to become more like the North, in a context of stability and growth and convergence, but also the North more like the South? And as I said, to avoid the labeling of a romantic Greek here, I mean south, not geographically, I mean it uh, figuratively and in terms of center and periphery. How would we measure progress in regions like Icaria with metrics other than those that put a negative sign on their presumed backwardness and other development that supposedly needs help in order to modernize and grow? What would a commission program bound to support alternative beyond growth models of development, really beyond growth models of development in Europe's peripheries would look like? What policies and what moneyed interests are destroy destroying right now such peripheries in the name of development and modernization? And importantly, how can we generalize the wisdom we find in places like Icaria? bringing healthy diets, local low-impact food, sustainable work schedules and rhythms, and communal forms of producing and celebrating all over Europe. I am a researcher and, uh, you know, I like to pose questions, which is a comfortable position. The good thing is that the European Research Council has uh, decided to support uh, us, me, my colleague Julia Steinberger, and Jason Hickel, to develop six years of research ask, uh, asking this and many other questions, and I think we're going to come up with some tentative answers. But I think there are many clever people also in, uh, in this room, and I'm really happy to discuss them with you. Thank you. Merci. On va passer maintenant aux questions. Normalement, la technologie, même si bon, on pourrait parler des questions technologiques, dans le rôle des technologies dans la, dans la post-croissance, voilà, va nous permettre d'avoir un certain nombre de questions qui ont été euh, classées en fonction euh, de leur euh, popularité, disons. Une première question pour Kate Rivos. Je vous laisse... La, la, Is the donut growth agnostic or actually advocates for degrowth and post capitalism? Do you want a quick answer? <laughs> okay. Um, donut economics applies to, it intends to be applicable to a very wide range of countries. So it's being put into practice in Malaysia, uh, in South Africa, in Chile. So it's relevant to many countries. And in that sense, it says, be growth agnostic in the sense that this is not what we're aiming for. We are aiming to be regenerative and distributive by design. When we come to the high income countries, the ones that, as you could see from the graphics, massively overshoot planetary boundaries, the, the 
imperative is to come back within planetary boundaries, what people call degrowth, right? Come back, reduce material use, reduce energy use. In that sense, to me, it's the same as degrowth. When we're talking within high-income countries, yes. And can those countries have ongoing GDP growth at the same time? I have seen absolutely no evidence that it's possible for those countries to continue pursuing GDP growth while reducing their material and energy use at the speed and scale that's required. Even the richest country, even, even the best performing countries are only reducing their carbon emissions maybe one or two percent per year. They need to be cutting around eight to ten percent a year. So we're nowhere close. And that's just carbon emissions. Material use is not even beginning to decouple. So to me, it's extremely important to end the growth dependency that is currently written into high-income countries across the whole of Europe and the US and all high-income countries to end this growth dependency so that we can actually create economies that thrive. So yes, I believe it's time to go beyond growth in the very true literal sense, go post-growth, free of growth dependency so that instead we could become regenerative and distributive. Je vais vous poser à chacun de vous tous, dans l'ordre d'intervention que, que nous avons eu en premier, les trois prochaines questions. Je vais vous demander d'y répondre en, dans une sorte de, de paquet. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire, finalement, hein, tout de suite, euh, à, no, à notre échelle, pour pouvoir euh, aller vers un monde de, décroissant Est-ce que la post-croissance, c'est juste une version politiquement correcte de la décroissance Et puis, qu'est-ce qui manque de quoi n'a-t-on pas parlé tout à l'heure, jusqu'à présent, et qui est extrêmement important J'en profite pour faire de la publicité. Moi, je pense que la question financière manque aux discussions que nous avons. Et nous aurons un panel exceptionnel mercredi à 11h. Je vous invite tous à, à y venir. Je donne la, la parole euh, au, au vice-président, si vous le voulez bien. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And it was really fascinating uh, interventions. And I would like to thank all the, all the uh, panelists for the interventions and, uh, and also for all the uh, applause, because I think it was, uh, as they say in French, bien, bien mérité. And I think uh, it was uh, uh, just uh, highlighting uh, how the arguments uh, proposed uh, uh, by, by, by the panel has been resonating with the, with the audience. I mean, coming. Um, Closer to the, to the question, I think uh, that uh, here I would like to avoid, because I'm not an academician, the academic discussion bec between degrowth, post-growth, or uh, I would say this type of uh, definitions. I think what is very important uh, uh, for uh, the people in European Union is that uh, they can look into the future and make sure that uh, we can set the, the, the standards and the path forward we should be built on sustainability and we should be built on sustainable economic, economic uh, uh, prosperity and we should be done in a way that uh, we would uh, protect the unique social model uh, of Europe. So therefore I think we didn't discuss that, that much today but I can tell you that in the European Commission uh, we are discussing on extremely frequent basis how to make sure that uh, Europe will remain competitive in this extremely sharp elbowed world. We just simply see that uh, trade policies, economic policies, especially of the big powers are becoming enormously assertive. And how to make sure that our economy would be that uh, competitive that it would guarantee us also in the future decades that we will have that social standards and that well-being which European citizens rightfully expect and that we can evolve it into the future. How to make sure that our health care would be better. How to make sure that we can invest more in sustainability, in environmental protection. How to guarantee that uh, the future generation of Europeans would have a proper skills uh, to be very well placed uh, on, the, on the labor market uh, where the dynamics of employment is changing so dramatically that uh, the top 
five jobs which are now uh, sought uh, by different employment agencies just didn't exist uh, 10 years ago. And that's, that's the dynamic uh, which uh, uh, we have to uh, understand and prepare our future generations uh, to, to deal with that. So how to make it in a sustainable way and at the same time have enough resources to protect and preserve a unique European social model. And I think that we have to do it uh, in a way that Europe will always rem remind uh, or uh, stay among the 